The Black Panthers played a crucial role of the development and the history and the success in the future of, um, you know, where Oakland is going. Extremely, like, thankful that they were, like, the ones that kind of a trailblaze for a lot of people. Black people have been pretty much on the, on the low end of the totem pole in this country for decades, centuries, and now we have to fight for what we want. All of the things we put Band-Aids over, everything's at a boiling point now. It reminds me of being a child again and eating some uh, Wheaties and watching on a little black and white TV, water hoses and dogs. If we want to see the change in our community, we have to be the change and we have to actively, you know, play a huge part. Well, that's really, really important that we change public attitudes toward supporting people. Housing, water, education, these are, these are things that are, are, are your birthright. I just always imagine one day being able to buy a home in my, in my city and be able to thrive and stay there and participate. This is the house that I was born and raised in here in Oakland. It was bought by my grandmother. I remember most, you know, I went to school in Berkeley because my mother didn't want me here in Oakland. I mean, it's just that difference between the freeway is what divides the quote unquote, the haves and the have nots. I can't just walk into Piedmont and necessarily get a place. Hell, you go in Piedmont now, they looking at you like, what the hell are you doing over here? My mom had me at 15 and three months later she turned 16. Coincidentally, I had my daughter at 15 and three months later turned 16. Um, pattern broken now, by the way. It was in 2007, my son was murdered. After my son died is when I found myself kind of going through the instability again. I had fallen behind on the rent and then I ended up losing my place. With sleeping in my car, driving, lifting, Uber. I didn't really sleep because I, you know, one eye open when I heard everything. I slept with the car running most of the time. Um, so, you know, if I had to just throw it and drive and go, I didn't have to, you know. Then I seen on TV, Moms for Housing, and it just brought back flashbacks for me because it was things that I had been through. I could see myself in the mirror. It was like looking at me all over again. I reached out and I got a call from Dominique. I've been a part ever since. Next, we will have Lachey speaking from Moms for Housing. So this is my first time, so forgive me if I stutter or anything like that. <laughs> a lot of things need to change. You have a lot of single people who have to spend more time at work than they do at home. So that means the children are watching themselves in some cases, and then they want to know why our streets are the way that they are. I want laws changed. I want the landlords to be held more responsible for the way that they treat people. If these newer generations really take over and take over the way they should, we might have a chance. I was blown away. It really like, it was just so moving to me. And like, I don't know why I feel so emotional right now, like talking about it, because like, it's just such a powerful action. Because you are Oakland. You are family. Oakland has a very rich history of being the heart of movements for liberation, specifically black liberation movements. You know, the Black Panthers. Oakland is seen as a threat because we are the city that will spark the fire that will create a real movement. We're not gonna leave New York and Chicago and Philadelphia, Detroit and Baltimore and all of these, Oakland is a mess. I felt like what Moms for Housing was doing was like on that level of just like mind blowing action. Good morning. Hi, good morning. You all ready? You all ready? Good morning. I am so heartened to announce an agreement among the Moms for Housing, Wedgwood Properties, and the Office of the Mayor. Over the last few days, Wedgwood has agreed to negotiate in good faith with the Oakland Community Land Trust to sell them at a price not exceeding the appraised value, the Magnolia Street House. I will add, um, I cannot condone unlawful acts but I can respect them 
and I can passionately advance the cause that inspired them. So just because something is the law does not make it right. It does not make it moral. It does not make it just. And it doesn't make it things that people should abide by. There is no change, no um, evolution of morality in this country that has happened without hardcore, strategic, tactical organizing and people putting their bodies on the line. Not one single thing from the abolition of slavery on down. What would a 91-year-old Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. have thought about the Moms for Housing? We stood up and we stood a big fight against giants. It was a fitting day to announce that the group of squatters who brought attention to Oakland's housing crisis may soon call themselves homeowners. We're ready to, to buy Mom's house and we're ready to um, continue this movement. While what the women did was wrong, their heart and their sentiment was correct. Wedgwood says it is changing the way they do business in Oakland and will offer community land trusts or the city the chance to buy their 18 other properties in Oakland. It's an important step forward. It's something that other communities may look to try to do. Dominique Walker's children might be too young to fully understand what Moms for Housing accomplished, but once they get older, they'll find out. This is a part of history, so they can always refer back to it, and I want them to always know to stand up for what they believe in. Dominique Walker said, I want speculators out of my hood! Yeah. <laughs> They've made the moral case for housing as a human right. I'm going to try to make the legal case for housing as a human right by introducing a constitutional amendment so that housing is a human right in, Cal in the state of California. We plan on using this space as a transitional home and working with the mothers who stay here on a program to get their credit together to make sure that they're, they have gainful employment. Um, we're working on creating a co-op and child care assistance. So um, it will be a transitional home for, for women to get their lives together. If this home had continued to remain the property of Wedgwood, it would already have a new family in it. It would be providing property taxes to the city of Oakland, and they'd have new residents in the neighborhood uh, on Magnolia Street. What's important is not political slogans like housing is human right, but actual action. And when you look at the action in Oakland, and one of the things that came out of the settlement with the city was the Oakland Community Land Trust has the right to first refusal on each one of the homes that the Wedgwood gets. They haven't purchased one of them. So, sorry television, but action talks bull****. Walks. I see this as a lunch counter sit-in. I see it like the first people to actually take this risk, make it easier for the next person or the next group to do it. The pandemic has people more desperate for housing. Two homeless women decided to take over a vacant home in San Francisco to shine a light on that issue. You are not alone! Today's action was inspired by Moms for Housing. It's alive of the scene right now in El Sereno. Tonight in full tactical gear, removing people from several vacant homes owned by Caltrans. It's literally a family that doesn't have a home. Our cameras captured at least three people detained as a growing group of demonstrators and some neighbors urged officers to stop. Hello, hello, how's it going everybody? We are two lazy boys. This one's about liberating your art supplies so that your creations are not tainted by the disgusting uh, legacy of capitalism and imperialism. Well, when I was a teenager, it was kind of before the 2008 financial collapse. So right after that, um, with all the foreclosed homes, he pretty much just bought all those up. Yeah, the neighborhood, Changed a lot after that. One, two, three, four. The foreclosure crisis has changed Martin Adro's boyhood neighborhood in West Oakland. It's like a ghost town now uh, on this block. Homes are boarded up, auction signs are posted, and there is no relief in sight. This house right here, that house over there, these have two units, this has two units, this is SMC house. Um, this house right here is the SMC property. We have this house right here that has two units. This house right here also. And this house right here, just on 
my one block. I saw an opportunity to invest in an area that I thought was incredibly diverse, incredibly interesting, and incredibly beautiful. When you first learned that, did that seem weird to you that one company owned so many properties on this one street? Yeah, absolutely. It was, I mean, it's astronomical. I had no idea that they had like 600 units uh, all around West Oakland. The foreclosure crisis devastated certain neighborhoods in the city, like parts of East and West Oakland. As residents lost their homes to foreclosure, it became a once in a generation opportunity for investors like Neil Sullivan. Corporations that bought homes during the foreclosure crisis are still among the largest owners in Oakland. Sullivan still owns at least 290 homes in the city, the vast majority of which are concentrated in West Oakland. The estimated property value of those homes is about $225 million, according to Property Radar. I do harm reduction at the encampment down the street, and a lot of those people have jobs, you know, and work full time, and they can't move to this neighborhood, and they all used to live here and everybody in the city just let this happen. You know, just let all these homes get foreclosed and bought up by one person. what we saw was a rise in the number of homes that were being purchased by investors, uh, large and small. We expected banks and the private sector to step in and resolve the crisis, when in fact it really should have been the role of the federal government. In every situation, the federal government conceded responsibility to the bank. So it was, all right, uh, let's sell off our distressed assets to a bunch of investors in bulk sales. I just commend everybody for being out here to continuing to fight. I organize with the SMC Tenants Council. I try to like talk with neighbors and bring them to meetings. It kind of came to a head once the pandemic hit and we all lost our jobs. See, this property purchased in 2012. Um, was a foreclosure cash purchase, $230,000 cash, currently valued at $1.4 million. It was empowering for us as a council to be able to see that our organizing does work. I grew up in the 80s. My mom use drugs, um, so I was raised by my grandparents um, with 12 other grandchildren um, in one home. We all stayed in one room. There was bunk beds on each side, girls, boys. We just made it work. It was a lot of good times, a lot of fights. I learned how to really fight. I don't even know how to feel now. I'm just getting hit with that information. To know that these corporations are still coming in and able to buy up homes 300 at a time, there, this has to be stopped. We have seen property prices explode over the last six or seven years. And all of that price appreciation has gone to higher income households, higher credit worthy households, and Wall Street capital or other investor capital. And so in neighborhoods like Fruitvale, we see about one in four homes that were purchased with a subprime loan or during sort of that subprime boom go into foreclosure. It requires exactly two requirements to participate. One is you've got to physically be there, and two, you've got to have cash in your hand. That's it. They would hold a million dollars in their hand in cashier's checks and buy a house in cash. This assumption in an auction that everybody there is competing and they go up to their top number and then the guy who can actually stand to spend a little more wins. But they had defeated that by having negotiations among themselves about how these properties would actually be bid on. And that's what bid rigging is, right? It's plausible to think that 
every county had some level of corruption. And then when we hit Alameda, it was a freaking nightmare because that was absolutely by far the most, the worst, the most blatant, and the, in some ways the easiest to investigate because it's kind of like selling drugs in public, right? People standing on a seat corner and somebody driving by in a car and putting, handing cash out the car window <laughs> and somebody handing a little bag that, you know, says narcotics on it. <laughs> I mean, that's how bad it was in Alameda. That is literally the way they were engaged in this behavior. By the time the whole thing was done, there were more than 50 different defendants. I don't think we ever really captured what the national level scope of it was. The world has been built on these unsustainable systems of white supremacy and colonialism and capitalism. We're in this moment right now where we're seeing the consequences of that very directly. We are very viscerally experiencing these unsustainable systems and seeing them crack and crumble. People are now starting to see the challenges that are faced by African Americans for doing the simplest thing. Playing your music too loud or jaywalking or, you know, coming out of a store where somebody said you had a counterfeit bill. How is it that we live in a society where an officer that knows he's being filmed would nevertheless continue to press on the neck of somebody for eight or nine minutes? until his life is extinguished. Demonstrators are still out in downtown Oakland, well past the city's 8 p.m. curfew. Uh, these are pictures from Broadway in Oakland. This is near Frank Agawa Plaza. Tonight's protest actually started after curfew, intentionally at 8.05 p.m. to protest the curfew and the death of George Floyd. This system was not made for any of us. America's not thinking about me. America's not thinking about you. America's not thinking about any of us. Power to the people. Power to the people. Oh yeah, mama's really <laughs> I'm so tired of these young people. And I'm so glad they turned out right because it means my old ass can retire. The only way black people are going to overcome anything is to fight for it, but we have to be united and we have to be organized. Well, in terms of concrete conditions, uh, things have actually gotten worse. We have been dispersed to the hinterlands. We're living under the bridges in Antioch and uh, wherever else black people have been sent to. There is no policy in the city of Oakland to develop or build affordable housing, period. We come up with tough sheds as a resolution to people living like dogs in the streets of Oakland. And in the case of blacks who want to develop property, develop housing, we're locked out and they're locked in. So you have to know that we're powerless to do very much of anything other than to organize ourselves. But what's going to happen here hopefully will be a beautiful housing development and we'll have every kind of amenity you can imagine. All the people that were here are formerly incarcerated. It's their farm, although we are here to launch it and pay for the resources and so forth. And we can do this all over West Oakland. Everywhere you see a vacant lot, we're gonna go get it. That's my position. And you can know that, and it's still not gonna stop me. I'm getting older. How do we transition? How do, we, how do I move to the next place of organizing? And I have been asked and even voluntold by hundreds of people at this point that my next calling yes. is to run for office yeah. for city council. Yeah. For this district of West Oakland. There is something intrinsically wrong with a system that allows people to live on the street in one of the most wealthiest countries in the world. This is our time, and we can change things. And I hope that you all will stand with me on November 3rd and do that. I love you, Oakland. Thank you. Do you want neoliberal thought progressives? 
or do you want tried and true community warriors with an analysis and a lived experience and a promise to be there for us and get the job well done. Carol fight for D3. Carol fight for D3. Carol fight for D3. Power to the people and power to this movement. We're taking our city back. Y'all have been put on notice. The Moms for Housing movement launched one of its founders right into the Oakland City Council. Carol Fife is the organizer behind the Moms for Housing. Carol, nice to have you on the program. Congratulations on being elected to the City Council in Oakland. Were you surprised by the election results? Honestly, I was not surprised. I think we're dealing with a group of people, a group of residents, many thousands throughout this, the district that wanted to see a change, and that's what happened. She defeated a candidate that, that you had endorsed. Do you take that as a sign that people in West Oakland are looking to go in a different direction or looking for new leadership when it comes to housing policy? I believe that Oaklanders believe that housing is a basic human need, that we have to do a better job as government to ensure that everyone has the dignity of safe housing. And Carol was a very effective champion for that concept. Um, she's an Oaklander with deep roots. She ran a very effective campaign, uh, lots of endorsements and support from labor, which is another Oakland value. Um, so I look forward to working with her as a new council member. The city council member elect is already making plans for what she will do to tackle Oakland's housing crisis. And the fact that they let me creep up into uh, city council, boys, oh my lord. <laughs> they didn't see me coming. It is people power that will change things. It is the only thing that will. Power conceives nothing without a demand. Are y'all ready to consistently make that demand? Yeah. Communities need to organize. Everyone has a stake in this. Everyone does. Because if we don't, we will be fighting every day. We'll be fighting this fight a hundred years from now until we address those things. How we practice capitalism and how we deal and confront our racist past. It's, it's not, nothing's gonna change. I mean, we could dress it up, but it's still a pig. You know what I mean? They put up new ones, yeah. I'm still in West Oakland, and I'm not leaving. They're probably gonna have to drag me out of here tooth and nail. I don't see myself leaving here until change happens, to where my kids will be able to be comfortable. My living situation now is still the same. I'm in temporary housing. I've been working two jobs still to try to make ends meet, but I'm, I'm just like a regular person. I'm just a mom, a fighter, someone who cares about others more than I just care about myself. And that's the thing, but to be acknowledged as like a leader or civil rights activist, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. That's what we're doing now. We're just preparing the food by categories so that we can serve the people. I'm extremely proud. I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of us as a group. And I'm, I'm gonna be proud to see what else we can do. I just knew I had to be a part of trying to re-stitch that old cloth. Pull that out the closet. It, it, it's tattered, it's torn, it's raggedy. And we gotta sew it back up. Blackberries, can we Because our community needs love. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> After the eviction, I moved to Berkeley. I have a year lease, but I'm still housing insecure because my lease is only a year. I think I'm gonna do activism wherever I am. I'm actually transitioning in uh, January to start pre-med, so. <laughs> you can see this is like her neighborhood now. She rides her bike through here. She cartwheels everywhere. <laughs> and <laughs> she's in school in Berkeley. It's been amazing. I'm glad to be an example for my, my children to stand up for something that you believe in and to fight for it. Even my daughter now, she, 
she screams out, moms are housing out the window randomly. So um, I feel like we got another, you know, revolutionary on our hands, and that's what's up. Housing every human right. Fight, fight, fight. Housing every human right. Fight, fight, fight.